Oh, hi. Uh, let me just uh, finish this email and I'll send it off. Right, and there we go. Hi, my name is Jordan, and uh, I, um, hmm, uh, wait, just a second. I, um, I sent this to the wrong person. Uh, let me try to recall this email and uh, send off a quick note to the DPO because that email had a lot of personal information in it. Just, just a moment. The UK ICO reports that most of the breaches and incidents that impact information are done through mistakes and errors. And there are a lot of other organizations around the world who have studied the same thing and they come to the same conclusion. The biggest threat and the biggest risk to information is mistakes and errors by people like you and me. By the end of this talk, I'll show you how you can reduce errors and mistakes and keep them from happening again, whether or not you're managing just yourself or other people too. The great thing is, is that it's not all about you. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it's all your fault and you have to fix everything and you need to change your ways. That's not it at all. We are in this together and we can help each other do better and help to identify the reasons for the mistakes and address those so that we don't have mistakes to begin with. But before I get going, I want to make a couple assumptions. First assumption, you don't come to work hoping to do a bad job. This might seem silly, but I want to start with this assumption because I think a lot of people have the assumption that people kind of do. And so when they make mistakes, then obviously it's because they didn't care enough or they didn't mind that the problems happened. That's not true in my experience. So let's make the assumption that you've not come into work on a daily basis to do a bad job. The second assumption is that you have taken the available training for information security, data protection, data handling that's been made available to you. Because if you have not taken training and you make an error or something goes wrong, that's no longer a mistake. That's a training issue and that's pretty easy to solve. So I'm going to make the assumption that you've taken this training, you understand it, and what we're dealing with are the mistakes and errors that happen when you know what you're supposed to do, but for some reason or another, it doesn't happen. Technology is tricky and it's complex and it changes all the time. I'm a highly technological person and I have trouble keeping up with the changes in technology too. I'm a lot like you. I'm running to keep up with changes. And in addition to this, during the pandemic, we're, most of us are working from home and working from home introduces its own challenges. We have different distractions. We have delivery people knocking on the door. We've got kids. We've got new pets for many of us. And these things add distractions and create an environment that we don't have when we're in the office. The other thing we don't have when we're in the office is other coworkers people who do the same types of work that we do, and we just naturally absorb ways of working and encouragements to work in a certain way, in a safe way, in a way that protects information, or in a way that benefits everybody. So when we're working from home, we're all isolated. We're isolated in this highly complex environment of digital work. We are dealing with all of these stresses in the environments of working at home, and the fact that we don't have this natural reinforcement of a work environment. And so that's why understanding human error, understanding the reasons for human error is so important. Because the error is never the point. The things that led up to the error, the things that happened just before that error, those are the things that matter most. And this might seem obvious, but Dr. Reason came up with a model which is a really useful lens to help us understand the human factors when it comes to incidents and accidents. His theory was that there are a lot of things in place that would naturally prevent some kind of an accident, an incident, or loss. And when an incident happens, it's because there was a weakness or a gap in all of those layers that have allowed that incident to happen. And this model, known as the reason model or the Swiss cheese model for obvious reasons, can be a really useful lens to help us understand why we make mistakes. And if you are a supervisor or a manager or someone in charge of a team or team lead, 
helping you understand how your team makes mistakes and help reduce the amount of mistakes that recur over time. Yes, training and procedures and following the things that you're supposed to do is important. And if you don't have adequate training or if you're not following procedures, these are the things that can create errors themselves. This type of approach doesn't excuse just blatantly wrong behavior, but what it means is that there are so many other factors that can contribute to that happening in the first place. And not everything is about someone who has just simply screwed up. There are a lot of other things that have connected to make that error happen. So besides training and following procedures, what are all these other layers? What are these other factors that can contribute to an error mistake happening? And so I'd like to introduce you to HVAC Cyber. HVAC Cyber is the world's first practical application of a human factors model applied to cybersecurity. It's born from HVAC, which was designed for the aviation industry to look at how to reduce accidents. HVAC Cyber categorizes those layers I talked about into four broad categories. You have organizational factors, you have supervisory factors, you have preconditions, and the unsafe acts themselves. Each layer affects the layer below it. So every factor exists in a relationship to the other factors. And understanding that relationship can help you find ways to make the changes that will be necessary to reduce incidents. So what are these layers? The organizational layer. This is where we find things like culture and policies and procedures. These are the things set at a high level in the organization that affects what work you actually do. The supervisory layer deals with things like adequate supervision. Is do you have someone who is providing enough guidance for you to do your job, do your work, do your tasks, and make sure you're doing the right things? It also includes things like poor supervision. So you might have enough supervision and enough guidance, but is it proper? Is it the proper guidance you should have been having? It also contains things like technological controls, the technology that prevents bad things from happening, or the tools that you use in order to work and handle information securely. And it's this layer that deals with things like asking workers to do things in such a way that security and data protection take a back seat. So this, contain, this can be things like um, giving too many tasks, overworking, uh, setting really strange priorities, or just simply not valuing security and data protection as part and parcel for how you do your work. So these are the types of things that, you, that affect how you do your work that have been set by the organization. These are the things that affect how you do your work as you do them. And then we have preconditions. These are the things that exist at the time you are doing your work. And we have things like situational factors, like that new puppy you just got, just made a puddle on the rug, and now you have to deal with that, and that's a bit of a distraction, and it causes some stress. That's a situational factor. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happened at the time that you perhaps made an error. There are personnel factors as well. Are there enough people in your team, your department, to do the work? Are you provided the right tools necessary to, to do your work? Is the training that you took, was it appropriate? Was it um, proper? Was it fit for purpose for the work that you're doing or not? And these are the types of things that can affect whether or not you were able to avoid mistakes. The other factor here within preconditions is the personal factor. We have personnel factors and personal factors. So how are you feeling? Did you have uh, enough sleep? Are you hungry? Is your body reacting to something you just ate? Are you on medications, new medications? Uh, is, your, is your eyesight uh, properly corrected if you need corrective lenses? All of these other things can help contribute to how you do your work at the time that you are doing your work. Then we have unsafe acts themselves. And these are the things that are the are the things that directly result in errors. And this is where people tend to focus, and they tend to keep their focus on these unsafe acts and not the other layers. So unsafe acts can, can, can encompass poor decisions. 
We're all making decisions all the time in how we do our work. There's no, there's no procedure that covers every eventuality. Uh, we're not factory workers on an assembly line. We deal with information and people all the time, and we're constantly making decisions. Sometimes those decisions are poor. Sometimes we have a lack of skill. Right? Sometimes it's because we haven't taken training or because of the training that we took wasn't uh, fit for purpose. Right? So we can have these lacks of skills, but these skills are the result of some other effect, some other factor that has contributed to it. There's also perception errors. You have perception errors like uh, misinterpreting information. Uh, for instance, in the email situation I was, I was in at the beginning of this presentation, I thought I was sending it to one recipient, but I was in actually sending it to another. And that's a perception error. I misinterpreted the email address even though it was right there in front of me. And then we have willful errors, also called violations, but let's call them willful errors. And this is where the person either maliciously wants to make a mistake and cause, cause disruption. That's extremely rare. But what is far more common, and I know you do this too, what's far more common is where we go against policy or procedure or our training or what we are supposed to do because we're just trying to get our jobs done. And this is a big issue for every organization and every team. There are certain procedures that need to be followed or are supposed to be followed, but those prevent you from actually doing your work. And so a lot of people come up with workarounds to make sure that they can just get their job done with all of these things that are preventing them from doing their work. So you can see that using this lens of these different layers of factors, that even a willful violation of policy and procedure and training can be the result of other issues within the organization that could be very, very easily corrected. The biggest value for using a human factors model, whether you use HVAC Cyber or some other human factors model or come up with one yourself, one of the biggest benefits of using human factors model for mistakes and errors is that it eliminates blame. It encourages a culture and an approach of empathy, learning, curiosity, and collective problem solving. It doesn't shove the entire problem of the mistakes and security and data protection on one person's lap. It allows the organization, the team, the supervisor, everybody around to take a step back and look to see how they might be contributing to the issue and how what they can do to eliminate those problems so that a worker can do the, their job as best they can. So how can we practically apply HVAC Cyber to the email situation that we started off with? How do we use these lenses in order to look for ways that we can change things to reduce the chance of that problem happening again. Let's look at the different layers involved. The unsafe act was a perception error. I sent an email to the wrong person thinking I was sending it to the right person. So even though the email is right there in front of me in the email, in the, in the two line, it was right there, it was being displayed correctly, my eyes didn't interpret it correctly because my brain was focused on other things. It was focused on you. So that was a perception error. All right, now let's take a look at what contributed to that perception error. Now note that I didn't say, why was there a perception error? Because the question why asked like that gets us a little too close to blame. Instead, if we depersonalize things and look for the contributing factors, what made the perception error a logical conclusion for the chain of events that happened? The perception error was a foregone conclusion. Right? If we make that assumption, what contributed to it? All right, so now let's look at the preconditions. The preconditions for my little email scenario was I was rushed. I was very rushed. I had uh, a split attention. I was trying to finish one task while trying to start a presentation at the same time. Crazy, I know. Uh, the other issue that I had was that my, my vision was split. I was visually distracted from the email to the camera and you wonderful people. And so I didn't have the attention on what I was supposed to be seeing in order to prevent the, the error. So what, what contributed to the perception error was being rushed, having attention split, and being distracted. 
And now let's take a look at the supervisory factors. Just because it's me alone in this scenario, and let's assume it's just me and I don't have supervisors or other people contributing to these factors, we can still use this supervisory factor lens. Because we can look at my ability to supervise myself, to manage my own time, my own processes, my own tasks, in a way. And it's kind of like using a professionalism lens, because I should have the ability to manage my own work, uh, using myself as my own employee. So I didn't give myself enough time to finish the email task or whatever I was doing before the presentation. I had poor prioritization because I should have been prioritizing the presentation and not hitting send on an email. And I also had a, a multitasking issue. I had a, a situation where I would normally be piling tasks on top of each other. And so I was trying to do multiple things at once, which is just poor task management. I've got a question for supervisors and managers and team leads. Do your direct reports feel that you do that to them? Now, I didn't ask if you thought you did it or not. I'm asking if your direct reports felt that you did it or not. And if they did feel that way, would you know about it? How would you know? Do you, would your direct reports feel like they could talk to you about it? One of the things that we can do within this human factors model is look for areas where we need to be gathering a little bit more information to know where we can have a positive effect in our organization and in our work. Okay, back to my scenario. The organizational factors also come into play even though I'm working by myself. Now, in this scenario, I don't have like cultural values at an organizational level or policies and procedures, but I do have personal values. And I also have personal procedures, ways that I do work, whether they be good habits or bad habits. Those are my own internal procedures and things like I call uh, personal rituals. How do I do things to make sure that my work is being done properly? And so in this scenario, I have a value of overwork. I have a value of trying to do multiple things at once because I'm trying to accomplish multiple things at once. And from an organizational perspective, me, from a personal value perspective, that may be something I might need to take a very hard look at if it's resulting in errors a lot of the time. So the value of overwork results in multitasking and uh, weird prioritization, which results in multitasking uh, too many things at once and not providing enough time to do the work that needs to be done, which resulted in a perception error, which resulted in a missent email. And you can see how all of these things contribute to one another, resulting in the end act. And you can see that there are multiple different ways that I can make changes to prevent that error. And this is a good thing. This is a great thing. When we are looking at ways that we can make a change and make a difference, we want to be able to find as many different options and as many different ideas as possible because we're not going to know what's going to work. Sometimes there are going to be very clear decisions where you can make and you know that it's going to make a huge impact, but we don't always know. So we want to have a lot of different options and a lot of different perspectives to find ways where we can uh, make a big change. And this is a, a good tip. When you're looking at all these factors, look at the place to make the smallest change to have the biggest impact. That doesn't mean that that's what you have to do, but if you can find these areas where small changes can have much, much bigger impacts, that's probably where you need to focus and where you, you could easily try making a change to make a big effect. So what could I have done in this particular scenario? There's lots of options here, and uh, I, this list isn't comprehensive or exhaustive at all, but they're ideas to throw on the table and to try. One is to have a personal ritual of checking the recipient of an email twice before hitting the send button. I do this personally. This is a per personal ritual of mine. I just simply click in the to field and make sure that in the drop down suggestions that I'm actually seeing the people that I'm supposed to be seeing and whether or not I need to be sending us to someone, to someone else. And with that ritual, I'm forced to evaluate whether or not I'm sending it to the right person. This works for me. Another option is to have a value of single tasking. 
taking time to focus on a task and do it and do it well. Another thing we could do is to have a supervisory factor, uh, a supervisory value of making sure that there's time between tasks so we don't feel like we have to smush all of these tasks together in one long running stream. And having these breaks mean that we can be sure that we are taking the time necessary to do a task well. And the other thing we can do is to listen and talk to others about their mistakes and their errors and what they have done to correct those issues and to resolve some of those factors and reduce their own mistakes. This openness means that we can get different perspectives and ideas that benefit everybody. This naturally happens in an office environment. Working from home, it is more challenging. but. Having an opportunity, for instance, in a daily or weekly meeting for people to discuss these things openly can be a really big help. I know we were just looking at a, a contrived personal scenario, but I hope that through this exercise you could see how you might apply this A to yourself and B, if you are a manager, a team lead, a department head, how you can start implementing these ideas in your environment, in your organization, so that you can identify how you can design your team, your department, your organization to support people in how to find ways to reduce your incidents, reduce your mistakes, and reduce your areas, and reduce your errors, and to be able to find ways to build a blame-free culture filled with empathy, learning, curiosity, and collaborative problem-solving. Thanks very much.